Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us in this introduction to land justice. My name is Sarah Bradley, and I'm a part of the Nuns and Nuns Land Justice Team, where we are creating land transitions centered in racial and ecological healing, and doing so specifically in collaboration with women religious and movement partners. Through our flagship focused community program, we work closely with seven to 10 religious communities to incorporate land justice into their property planning process and upcoming land transitions. Using a cohort model for multiple communities to be together at once, our work focuses on education and accompaniment, creating a community of practice, partnership building with potential stewards, as well as technical support from our faculty of aligned practitioners in law, real estate, and land trusts. Plus, to support the broader ecosystem of land justice, we also offer public programming to educate and mobilize other landowners, people of faith, and aligned activists to practice land justice in their own contexts and spheres of influence. We define land justice as the practice of centering social, racial, and ecological justice in decisions about how land is used, loved, and governed by people. There are three key and intertwined components of land justice. First, protecting land from extractive development. Second, regenerating the health of ecosystems. And third, shifting equity and control of land to communities who have been systemically dispossessed of land, especially Black and Indigenous stewards. Our hope by the end of this session is that you will know a whole lot more about land justice and why it's needed. We hope you will come away with an understanding of how the church and its purported doctrine of discovery created the conditions of our extractive economy and private property system, as well as the outcome of those projects, namely the climate crisis and pervasive and systemic racism. It's also our hope that you'll come away with an understanding of how land justice, including concrete examples of it, can be the medicine that moves us towards racial and ecological justice, and how you can be an active part of this movement. First, we'll start by sharing a bit about how Nuns and Nuns Land Justice came to be. I'll begin by saying that the Land Justice Project was born out of relationships, through unlikely conversations and listening to the moment. Nuns and Nuns began in 2016 as a place of encounter, encounter between older women religious and younger community-oriented activists of many spiritual backgrounds, many of whom did not claim one religious affiliation, earning the nickname Nuns or None of the Above. These encounters took the form of dialogues and meetups all over the country and centered on shared interests of justice, spiritual formation, and community. I found this movement when I was in my late 20s, exploring important questions for my own life. I was so deeply inspired by how religious life was a practical pathway to a radical economy and way of life. Generations of women pooling their resources so that they could support one another to live counterculturally and in accordance with their deepest values and call of spirit. And that's what I wanted. As these nuns and nuns encounters unfolded, two things happened simultaneously. First, our nation began to more intensively face long-standing existential reckonings. The intertwined crises of pandemic, climate collapse, and racial injustice revealed just how deep the roots of colonization and racism run through our history and how pervasive their impacts are in our society today. Secondly, we witnessed our friends, the sisters, move through the experience of their communities aging and growing smaller and 
needing to make some very tough decisions. We found ourselves in conversations with words like diminishment, divestment, and disposal of tangible assets. Most communities of women religious in the country are either facing now or will soon be facing the need to make long-term decisions about what to do with land and property. This is also true of many churches, parishes, and even families as the baby boomer generation ages. So we began to ask, given what time it is on the clock of the world, to quote the late great Grace Lee Boggs, given the ecological and racial healing that so desperately needs to take place in our time, what then shall we, the nuns and the nuns, do together? So we started to have a lot of conversations. We talked to sisters, we talked to retreat centers, we talked to grassroots movement partners. And by that, I mean climate justice groups and rematriation and reparations leaders and solidarity economy collectives. And so it was through asking that question and the conversations it prompted, we began to see our role. We saw that so many grassroots groups, especially black and indigenous collectives are ready to take on and steward land, but continue to be blocked from access and ownership. Furthermore, because people of color have been the most impacted by extraction-based racial capitalism and by the effects of the climate crisis, they often hold some of the most clear, powerful, and creative perspectives about how to shift course, how to find solutions, and how to restore the land while also restoring their own communities. That means that one of the biggest barriers to climate and racial justice initiatives today is access to land. We also found that there was no community or support for religious landowners to get more creative and bold about how decisions about land could best reflect their values. Landowners needed to be organized in order for land justice to happen. And that simply wasn't happening at any sort of scale. So with the steadfast encouragement of sisters and movement partners, the Nuns and Nuns Land Justice Project was born in 2021 with the purpose of supporting religious communities to incorporate land justice into their property planning. Now, decisions about property can feel daunting and they're often held in this very narrow business mindset rather than a holistic or values rooted one. People often separate their justice work or their ministry from these kinds of decisions. However, in the first two years of this work, it's become clear to us that land and property is key to both racial and ecological healing in this country. Who owns it? What happens on it? Who governs it? Land plays an integral role in how communities heal among themselves and heal with other communities. Land holds our stories, and she is the site of our country's great original sins. As such, repairing those harms through the decisions we make about land today can be our hope. And it's how we will create a livable future for all of us. So we see the potential for property decisions to bring forth powerful transformation in our society. If people of faith were to center land justice in their property decisions, it could be one of the most significant things we do. It could help tell a new story of what's possible. But in order to tell a new story, we have to understand the old ones we're living in right now. The stories of how we got here, the roots of land injustice, so that we might move from a foundation of truth towards repair. In his writings about sustainable economies, E.F. Schumacher wrote, one who uses an imaginary map 
thinking that it is a true one is likely to be worse off than someone with no map at all. For 500 years, when it comes to our dominant culture and especially land and property, this has been our map. This is one of the three 15th century papal bulls or legal decrees, letters by the Pope that make up the doctrine of discovery. These decrees compelled European nations to quote, invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all non-Christians. Through these bulls, the church declared that any land not inhabited or ruled by Christians was available to be discovered and claimed outright. These papal bulls acted as the legal, political, moral, and spiritual justification for some of the most heinous projects of the next centuries. The genocide of indigenous peoples and theft of indigenous lands, the transatlantic slave trade, and by 1914, the colonization of 84% of the land on earth by European nations and their descendants, including the landmass now called the United States. These decrees were inherently white supremacist and Christian supremacist, and they justified grotesque violence. As many of you are aware, the Vatican recently repudiated the doctrine, stating that its ideas are antithetical to Catholic teaching. However, it's critical to clarify that this announcement did not formally repeal or rescind the doctrine. It did not take responsibility for its implementation. It did not put resources towards making amends or reparations, nor did it extricate it from our current legal system. The doctrine of discovery is an active legal doctrine in the United States. It is a linchpin in the foundation of modern property law. 200 years ago this year, in a case called Johnson v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court enshrined these papal bulls into US law, citing that, quote, discovery is the foundation of title and this overlooks all proprietary rights in the natives. Now, this is one of the first cases that new lawyers learn in law school. It is considered one of the bedrock cases in US property law to this day, and it set the precedent for everything else that would follow. The papal bulls have been cited by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005 in a case that ruled against the United people who were trying to recover their stolen land in what is now upstate New York. A majority opinion, mind you, written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Again, at the time of their writing, the papal bulls that make up the doctrine of discovery served as the justification for European settlers to seize land inhabited by non-Christians but also to behave as if non-Christian and non-European people were less than fully human. This legacy is still present with us today, and not just as an echo, but as an active ideology that is practiced through our dominant culture and systems and takes many shapes. Many of you will recognize this image from school history books. It depicts Manifest Destiny, or the westward expansion of white settlers into what is now the United States. Notice that as the angel and the white farmers are moving in, the native people and the buffalo are fleeing, almost disappearing off the page. White settlers believed they had the right to kick people off their land, to destroy their way of life, and to take whatever they found. This belief is rooted in the doctrine of discovery. This image also promotes the false idea that as the United States grew into what it has become, the peoples indigenous to this land just disappeared and gave up. 
which is obviously not true. What's not pictured here is that settlers also believed they had the right to capture and enslave indigenous African people and bring them here to work the lands they stole, thereby creating an economy that depended on the domination, not just of native land, but black bodies, knowledge and labor. We see how this system shape shifts in the many ways that people of color are dispossessed of land still today, how immigrants of color are exploited for their labor and how people who control land and political influence find new ways to extract profits through destructive behavior. Again, this is an economy that is built upon extracting wealth from the land and the labor of people of color. And it bears a direct line of connection to the papal bulls. We can see this story through another image. This is a place you'll likely recognize and know by the name of Mount Rushmore. However, this place located in the Black Hills has a much older name, Hesapa. It is one of the most sacred grounds for the Acheti Shakui, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. It is their emergence point, akin to a Christian's Garden of Eden. Led by the U.S. Army and the greed of gold mining interests, white colonists stole these sacred hills using violence, knowingly breaking a treaty in which the U.S. had agreed to never touch these hills. Then, into that sacred stone, a part of which the Lakota called the Six Grandfathers, they carved the faces of four of their white leaders, each of whom participated in genocide against indigenous people. During President Trump's July 4th celebrations at Mount Rushmore in 2020, a group of Lakota activists exercised their right to free speech and their responsibilities as the rightful stewards of the Black Hills, demanding the return of Hesapa, which under treaty law is still their land. These activists were arrested by police dressed in riot gear and criminally charged for simply standing up for their rights guaranteed to their nation by treaty with the United States government. This picture is an apt metaphor for how we got to where we are today through land theft, destruction, and cultural domination. And where we are currently is that 98% of private land in the United States is owned or controlled by white people rather than indigenous people who up until recently had communally stewarded this land since time immemorial. There's an important reframe needed as we understand the story of colonization. Many of us grew up with the idea that the U.S. is a nation of immigrants. However, immigrants take on and adapt to the local customs, the language, the laws and governance, and other social systems of the place they move to. That is not what happened on Turtle Island. The more accurate description for the dominant U.S. system and culture is that it reflects a nation of settlers. Settlers destroy in order to replace. Rather than adapt to indigenous economies and ways of life, white settlers violently imposed their own. Rather than respecting the sovereignty of the nations they were moving to, white settlers attempted to eradicate them and force them into subjugation and dependency on the colonial state. So, to review the land story here, it was through the doctrine of discovery that indigenous lands were stolen and allotted into parcels and then given or sold to white people by white colonial governments. Now there's a lot more we could get into about exactly how this happened involving treaties and US trading posts and Indian agents, patents and all sorts of acts by Congress, including the Homestead Act and the Dawes Act. But for now, this simple statement will stand. 
land was stolen from indigenous people by the US government and then given freely or sold for pennies on the dollar to white settlers. Land, which continued to be passed down and sold as private property, enforced and policed by the state. We see these hard boundaries and fences, barbed wire, and no trespassing signs. For many people, the only choices are to accept these lines or face state violence. Now, once these grids of private property were created by the US government, the state and settlers adopted this idea of fair market value of land. That is a monetary value of land that would match the price that the highest bidders are willing to pay. Fair market value of land is often thought of as natural and inevitable, but it's important to remember that it's a fairly new practice in human history. And there have been many other ways societies have made decisions about land. Fair market just means that the people with the most money, not the people with the deepest relationships or the ones best positioned to steward land, get to decide what happens to land. As such, it might be much more accurate to call this concept unfair market value. And as will likely surprise no one here, in US society, the highest bidder is statistically most likely white. Today, the median white family in the US has a net wealth of $147,000 while the median black family has a net wealth of 3,500. This is but one facet of the racial wealth and wellness gap. The racial wealth gap comes from an accumulation of many forms of harm to communities of color. The projects of colonization, enslavement, and land theft that we've been talking about, but also redlining, incarceration, and many, many other forms of discrimination. On the other side of the wealth gap, white people in our society have accumulated massive amounts of wealth because the system has been designed for us to acquire and then pass down property to heirs over centuries. White families have 16 times more wealth than black families. The average Native American household has eight cents of wealth for every dollar of wealth in the average white American household. Native Americans have the highest national poverty rate at 25.4% compared with 8% for white Americans. This is of course a self-perpetuating wealth gap. We can talk about this dynamic with academic and economic terms like primitive accumulation and regulatory capture, but the result is simple. Because white settlers and the colonial state stole native land and black labor, they amassed enormous wealth. And because those with wealth can leverage it to direct political agendas, they protect and increase that wealth and status through our various social systems across time. In land, we see that the result today is that 98% of private rural land and 95% of urban land is owned by white people. Meanwhile, people of color continue to be the labor backbone of our economy, comprising 70% of the farmers in this country. So farmers of color are 70% of the agricultural workforce, but own less than 2% of the farmland. This means we probably all ate something today grown by a farmer of color who works on white owned land. So the doctrine of discovery set up our current paradigm and system of treating land as a commodity, but it did not just make an object of the world. It gave individuals the right to destroy the land they own. As a landowner, you get a whole bundle of rights that convey with title like the right to lease, to occupy, to sell, to develop, but you also get the right to destroy it. So not only did this doctrine 
justify the stealing of land and the enslavement of human beings and the genocide of human beings, but it also supported the concept that land was a thing that could be bought and sold and mistreated for profit. Last April, we hosted a conversation with four indigenous and Afro-Indigenous leaders about the doctrine's repudiation. In that conversation, Danae Elder, Pat McCabe put it simply, the doctrine wasn't just a moral or ethical imposition, it was the beginning of the destruction of this mother earth in her entirety. The church's logic of white Christian superiority over all of creation was cemented into a modern economy that hinges on the extraction of people and the earth for the profit of a few. And with that, we need to recognize some plain facts. Since those papal bulls and the colonial contact that followed, in the US, we have lost 90 to 95% of old growth forest. We've lost 99% of prairie and a third of our topsoil. It is estimated that we have less than 60 harvest seasons of topsoil left, and we are losing it far faster than it can be replenished. Meanwhile, land is being developed at a rate of 1,500 acres a day. And from the Willow oil drilling project in Alaska to Enbridge oil pipelines in the Midwest, our elected officials, banks, and businesses continue to promote and profit off this destruction. Again, all of this has happened during the centuries and decades when land has been in the overwhelming control of white settlers in the state, 98% of private land. So we have to ask the question, if settler colonialism is destroying to replace, replace with what? What kind of society? What has the doctrine of discovery created in and through us? To turn the tide in this society, we need to recognize our need for leadership that is appropriate for the task at hand. In La Dato Si, Pope Francis writes, when indigenous peoples remain on their land, they themselves care for it best. He implores Catholics to build relationships with indigenous people as the primary dialogue partners when it comes to care for the earth. Of course, science backs these assertions. While indigenous people make up less than 5% of the world's population, they protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And we can see it here in this aerial image of the aftermath of the bootleg fire in Oregon, where the completely scorched area there at the top was managed by the U.S. Forest Service. The slightly damaged but still surviving area down there at the bottom was co-managed with the Klamath. And the area that made it out the best there in the middle was under sole management of the Klamath tribe. Indigenous people, when allowed to practice their communal traditions and land management systems, know how to care for and steward the land they have co-evolved with. This is one reason why the land back and climate justice movements are so intertwined. When we make these connections, it becomes clear that racism and colonization are the root of our climate crisis. And the church bears a significant responsibility for the project of colonization that has led us here and that maintains the status quo. And so even though the Vatican has publicly rejected the statements made in these bulls, the damage has been done. It's not enough to say, sorry, we were wrong. While apologies are necessary, alone they are insufficient. As Catholics, if we want to engage in the work of healing and repairing both ecological and racial relationships, we need to grapple with this history 
and our role in it. And we need to do the work to undo the damage, both to land and people. Our friend Sarah Augustine, a Pueblo minister from New Mexico and leader in the Mennonite church, says of the doctrine of discovery, what was done in the name of Christ must be undone in the name of Christ. After hundreds of years of the racial harm and ecological destruction that has been brought about by the doctrine of discovery, we are today witnessing a growing movement to address these harms, a movement to engage with the world from a completely different paradigm. So the legacy of the doctrine of discovery can be undone. Pope Francis also wrote in Laudato Si, now is not an era of change, but a change of era. By doing land justice, by taking responsibility for this legacy and joining the movements for mending it, we can contribute to that change of era. The Catholic Church, as an actor and instigator of the project of colonization, as well as the single largest private land-owning entity in the world, has the potential to leverage great resources to tangibly address the climate crisis, regenerate ecosystems, and correct these wrongs of the past and present. And women religious and lay Catholics in the United States can lead the church towards what is right. Now you might be asking, okay, I get the need for land justice. I understand its importance in this moment, but how? What does it look like? Well, we're going to show you. I'm going to give a few examples, but I'll also say that when it comes to making choices about land, many of us have the false idea that we can either prioritize ecological healing or prioritize racial justice, but not both. And that's a false binary. Perhaps there are many rigid binaries in our mind when we think about land. So instead, we imagine land justice to be more like this, a colorful space in between, full of creativity and possibility. And in practicing land justice, in making a new map for how we make decisions about land, the path is also gonna look a little bit like this. There's no one way up this mountain. If the goal is land justice and we're walking towards it, every community is going to be working with a different context. And if you think about it, when we're moving without a map, we actually have to pay a lot of attention all of a sudden. Like where is the sun rising and which way is north and where's the water? What's the slope of this terrain? Those kinds of questions. So I'm going to invite you into the practice of attentiveness, of looking for clues for how you might move forward as you receive these stories. And I'll also just say, I feel like I have the best job in the world because I get to be a student of promising examples like these. And I'm here to say that they are happening. They're out there. And this time requires immense imagination and creativity. So don't even let these stories limit your imagination. The Land Justice Project is here to help support the process. And I haven't learned as much as I have in my life, my entire life, than I have in the past two years as we've opened up these questions and learned from the people doing this on the ground. So I'm gonna give four short stories of how religious landowners have taken steps towards land justice. And the first one is the Shinnecock kelp farmers and the CSJs of Brentwood, New York. This is a picture of the Shinnecock kelp farmers, six women indigenous to the area called Long Island. Their project began because these women saw that all the Hampton Bays on Long Island, including Shinnecock Bay, were being polluted by billionaire septic systems and golf courses, causing huge algae blooms and dead zones. Now, the Shinnecock carry an ancestral practice which is extremely helpful in this situation, growing kelp. For at least 10,000 years, 
The Shinnecock have grown kelp as a food source, a versatile fiber for traditional uses, and as an ecological management system. Kelp filters carbon dioxide at a rate 20 times that of a forest on land. And it also filters nitrogen out of the water, which is what creates those algae blooms. So the Shinnecock wanted to reclaim their traditional practice in order to clean the waters. But because of the system and the story we've named and are living in, their reservation is relegated to the marshiest part of the bay. So they needed better coastal access. And guess who had some? Why, the Sisters of St. Joseph in Brentwood, New York. Their nine acre retreat center property is right there on Shinnecock Bay. I'll shout out here that the CSJs in Brentwood are one of our first seven focused communities. The Shinnecock knew the CSJs because some of those sisters had been showing up to their protests for a few years. So Becky, the elder in the Shinnecock group, and she's the second from the left in that picture, went up to Sister Joan Gallagher and said, this is what we wanna do. And Joan said, absolutely, whatever you need will help. So together, they turned a building of the retreat center into a kelp hatchery, and the Shinnecock revived this 10,000-year-old practice. The sisters donated a car to one of the members who was having transportation issues so that she could keep coming and farming. And what Joan says of this relationship is really beautiful. She says, being in relationship with the Shinnecock in solidarity must be at the heart of who we are because a future emerges from the relationships that we cultivate in the present. So in this example, we see that making a commitment to re a reparative relationship of solidarity and for that commitment to be a core part of identity is a step towards land justice. Even if it hasn't yet resulted in a formal transition of land, it's creating the conditions in which land justice can happen, where trust can be built and conversations can be had. Number two, a cultural use easement. This is Clayalting. It's an original village site of the Teninque tribe in California. This land is their sacred village site where they would hold all of their ceremonies. It's now privately owned by a white person who was building relationships with the tribe and asked them, what do you want? How can we be good partners to you? In this case, the tribe replied, you know, we don't actually have the capacity right now to own this land or be the primary managers. At least that's not what we want right now. But we do want to come back to our village site and hold our ceremonies like the coming of age ceremonies that are so important to our youth. They wanted to be able to access the land and they wanted that access to be legally protected. After that, the landowner works to remix a conservation easement into something called a cultural use easement. You're likely familiar with conservation easements, whereby an owner gives another entity, often a land trust or conservancy, the right to make sure that no new development happens on that land. With those easements, rights are given and protected forever. They go with the land, they go with title. The same is true for cultural use easements, except that the rights are slightly different, as is the recipient. With the cultural use easement, a tribe or members of a tribe are given the right to access and use the land for gathering medicinal plants, practicing ceremony, or any cultural or educational practice. And that right is protected in perpetuity. So here, the trauma of broken promises and treaties that many indigenous people have faced is in a way eased by this legal agreement. Now, this is a, a bit of a blurry picture, but 
It shows the Tseninque people doing their coming of age ceremony for young women, the flower dance, at their ancestral village site for the first time in 300 years. They got to do this ceremony knowing that they'll be able to return and do this dance every year from now on. Hey, number three, this is Stony Point Church in the state of New York. It's a Presbyterian church that back in its heyday had about 200 people in pews on a Sunday. By about five or so years ago, that number had dwindled to about a dozen. And so the Presbytery made the hard decision to close the church and absorb the members into a neighboring church. They planned on selling the building, but the church congregants had recently begun building relationships with the Ramapo Lenape, who are the original inhabitants of that land. They had started making connections, actually, after being inspired by the Presbyterian Church's repudiation of the Doctrine of Discovery. So it was because of those relationships, the church did something else instead of selling it. They gave the church and the land to the Ramapo Lenape and with them created the Sweetwater Cultural Center. Here we can see a photo of the signing of the transfer of the deed with the leader of the presbytery, along with Chief Dwayne Perry of the Ramapo Lenape. And so with that transfer of property, the Sweetwater Cultural Center was created, a space of hospitality, cultural practice and ceremony for indigenous people in the region, but also around the world, as the UN headquarters is in nearby New York City. We have to remember that indigenous ceremony is so deeply connected to the land, to the earth, to being people of the land. So reclamation of ceremony, which was illegal in the United States until 1978, is also a reclamation of relationship with their land. So now, as indigenous leaders and advocates travel thousands of miles from home to go to the UN and represent their nations and defend their lands, and they arrive in a remarkably foreign and stressful urban setting, with the Sweetwater Cultural Center, they have a space to go where they can freely practice their religion, where they can rest, and where they can resource themselves spiritually for the global struggle for indigenous sovereignty. Now, this is an example of a direct transfer of title, where ownership transfers, which is the strongest end of the spectrum of land justice because it shifts power, equity, and control. In this case, the deed to the land was gifted to the Ramapo Lenape at no cost, with the deed going to a new nonprofit, which tribal members govern. In contexts where donating land is possible, it can be the most appropriate as the land was stolen to begin with. I'll debunk a myth right now and confirm that it is completely legal for a 501c3 to donate land to another entity, including another C3, if that donation is in alignment with the organization's mission and values. While donating land can certainly be the most just and fitting course of action, I'll give one caveat and say that we've also learned that some BIPOC collectives would prefer a simple purchase rather than a gift that comes with strings. Because, well, it can be a cleaner process with clearer autonomy, which is totally understandable. But even with a purchase, land justice is possible, as you can transfer land through a bargain sale, that is, selling the land at a below market price. A seller can always work with a desired buyer, say a tribe, to determine a price and a timeline that is feasible for them. And they can also offer support in fundraising for purchase, as well as any legal or administrative costs. Okay, we're rounding the corner. Story number four. This is Callie Walker. She's a Methodist minister in Virginia. And that picture on the left is her family's 100-acre farm that she inherited from her father. Callie and her husband dreamed of having an intentional community on the land there, but they were running into some barriers and not really finding people that were sticking. 
One day, Callie went to an organic farming conference. There, she heard a presentation by Duran Chavis, a farmer and food activist in the nearby city of Richmond, where she learned about the history of Black land dispossession in the United States. In the last 100 years, Black farmers went from owning 14% of all farmland in the U.S. to less than 1% because of campaigns of racial terror, as well as racist heirs law practices. Duran is trying to reclaim the Black community's relationship with land and access to healthy foods in and around Richmond. He's creating a whole BIPOC-led food system that's bringing healthy food and the Black agrarian tradition back into his community that has been denied it for generations. In hearing Duran's story and learning of his work, Callie realized, actually, this is the community dream I was meant to serve. It's actually yours to live out, and I want to support you in doing that. So Callie donated her farm, which is now part of a network of properties in and around the Richmond area, both rural and urban. And this is a network that is training a steady stream of Black farmers, from small urban plots to large-scale farms like Cali's. And this entire network of properties is communally owned in a really special and different kind of land trust called an agrarian commons, which is designed to protect long-term farmland tenure for farmers. So not only is this land going to good use, but in an entirely new model of community held land stewardship is thriving from it with local governance at the grassroots level and national support. This means that she gets to live out her days on the family land right alongside this amazing land justice project. So she says, you know, I'm not giving up anything. She says, I'm trading my land for the best neighbors in the world. There's a growing number of indigenous, black, and POC governed land trusts with the explicit purpose of recovering, protecting, and regenerating lands, and also reviving communal ancestral practices. Callie's story also shows the kind of healing that can happen and the kind of new relational weaving that was not there before when those who hold much of the power and ownership relinquish their control over vision and recognize that we should resource people who hold a new or perhaps ancient vision. So in all of these stories, we see again, there is no one way, but all of these stories start with relationship and solidarity, and they end with extending trust and sharing control. In all of them, there's a lot to figure out. It's not always easy by any means, but there is also love and joy present. These stories are a testament that the decisions that people of faith can make about land can literally create the groundwork for the kind of world, the kind of economy, the kind of lives and paradigms that we dream of and that this earth needs. And maybe you're thinking, okay, but is something like a two-acre plot even meaningful, enough to change a paradigm? Well, I'm here to say that that is what a placeless economy wants you to think. But the future is going to be local. It's going to be place-rooted, loving the land. And a climate-just future will happen in places of all shapes and sizes and locations. So again, we're looking at this change of era which includes our very worldview of what matters or what counts as significant. You might be familiar with this image from Meg Wheatley. This is an image of a dominant system coming to a close and an emergent system arising from the ashes. We are in a change of era and many of the institutions around us are in this moment of transformation. So we're kind of between worlds. Perhaps you feel that acutely where you are. Meg Wheatley does a lot of work to identify different roles and jobs related to this transition work. With land justice, we're talking about 
Who is resourcing the new paradigm? So who's helping to create the places where this transformation can happen? The places that can lay the literal groundwork for a justice-rooted, climate-resilient future. Religious communities can be very powerful in this moment. If communities opt to do land justice and do it together, it could change so much of what's possible in this world. Not only because you can change what happens on the lands that you love, but because you're one of the most forward-thinking, culturally powerful constituents of the largest private landowner in the world, the Catholic Church. So what you do, and what you do alongside other religious communities, could change the way the largest private landowner in the world thinks about land. Imagine if land justice were the new precedent for how any religious group made decisions about the future of their property. Imagine what kind of future those decisions could open up. We need communities to help make those futures possible by rolling up their sleeves and exploring new models. But this work doesn't have to happen in isolation or silos. The Focus Communities Program is designed to create a community of practice for women religious from all over who are learning how to bring this vision to life in their own context. Together, we are creating new stories on sacred lands. So we hope you'll join us. Please click the link below to learn more about our Focus Community Program. And thank you so much.